Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And this is me at my high school graduation party in my Pink Floyd shirt in front of my Pink Floyd poster performing the Pink Floyd song Comfortably Numb. I was playing keyboards and singing the less challenging Roger Waters vocal parts while my friend Lisa sang the more challenging David Gilmore vocal parts. We were accompanied by my friends Andy on drums, Pat on bass, and Eric on guitar. And I will leave it as an exercise for the viewer to figure out what decade this was. The keyboards in front of me are the Korg DSS-1 and the Insonic EPS, both of which are samplers, which are the subject of today's lesson. In the previous two parts of this lecture, we've talked about synthesis using analog and digital techniques. In this lecture, we'll talk about an alternative approach called sampling, although, as we'll see, the difference between a sampler and a synthesizer can be a bit blurry. The idea behind digital sampling is to take sounds, perhaps from an acoustic instrument recorded with a microphone, or perhaps created by an analog or digital synthesizer, and store those as a sequence of digital samples, and then play them back at different rates. If you play it back at a faster rate, you get a higher pitch. If you play it back at a slower rate, you get a lower pitch. You also will generally have the effect of the higher pitch samples sounding like Munchkins and the lower pitch samples sounding like Darth Vader, which might be considered a bug or a feature. Now, this general idea is fairly old. It was referred to as musique concrète, where people would make tape recordings of various sounds and then play those tapes at different speeds, or maybe even play them backwards, and then splice those tapes together to create their composition. Obviously, this is a fairly tedious way of putting a piece of music together. If you would like to know more about this old-school approach, I would highly recommend you check out the analysis of Stockhausen by Samuel Andreev on YouTube. And I would also recommend Samuel's channel in general, there's really no one else on YouTube doing these kind of deep dive analyses of, uh, for the lack of a better term, serious 20th century avant-garde music. He digs into composers like Boulez and Ligeti and Pendereski and Captain Beefheart. Digital sampling allowed people to create music in real time. One early well-known commercial sampling instrument was the Fairlight CMI, these things had really cruddy technical specifications compared to what we have today, but some tremendously amazing music was made with them. They were a bit on the expensive side. And remember, this is twenty-five dollars to $50,000. That seems like a lot of money for today. And it was really, really, really a lot of money back in 1979. So only folks like Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush could afford something like this, or perhaps Trevin Horn. There's a really classic orchestral hit sound that you'll hear in Owner of a Lonely Heart by Yes. I just found this little tidbit somewhere. I don't actually know anything about the Quasar M8, but the idea of something that boots from paper tape sounds really intriguing. The other super expensive sampler of the era would have been the Synclavier, which started out just having FM voices, kind of like the DX7, but later added a sampling option. Like the Synclavier, the main keyboard interface wasn't the part that generated the sound. That would have been this bit down here with these glorious 8-inch drives. The cards that produced the sound were in this cabinet, and an interesting thing about them was that each voice had its own sample memory. So each voice could play a different sound, but if you were wanting all of your voices to be the same sound, this was highly inefficient because basically each card has its own copy of the same set of sample data. The folks at Emu looked at this and said, hey, there must be a better way to do this. So they developed a machine, the Emu emulator, where multiple voices could share the same sample data and the same part of memory. A lot of folks think that the company Emu got its name from the word emulator, but it's actually the other way around. Emu produced analog modular systems, and actually Dave Rossum of Emu designed some analog synthesis chips like the SSM2040 filter chip. And apparently it took them a while to come up with a name for the new sampler, but once they came up with it, it was fairly obvious. So this is certainly cheaper than things like the Synclavier and the Fairlight, but it was still not terribly cheap. And remember, this is $10,000 in 1981. 
But eventually the prices on these things went down as the capabilities went up, Moore's Law and all that. So eventually you had samplers that non-extremely wealthy musicians could afford, such as the Insonic Mirage. You'll hear the Mirage all over some Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis productions, particularly the early Janet Jackson albums. And like the Fairlight CMI, the Mirage had really terrible technical specs from a scientific point of view, but the folks who knew how to wrangle it got some really great music out of it. The Mirage was probably the first exposure of a lot of people to the hexadecimal number system because you had to program the thing through this two-digit display that would display things in hex, which is just kind of crazy to think about now. Before the drum machines designed by Roger Lynn came out, drum machines produced their sounds using analog synthesis techniques. Now, to create a machine that would play back samples of real drums at the time was a fairly expensive proposition. Essentially, each drum sound was produced by a separate digital-to-analog converter, and the signals from those digital analog converters were mixed in analog. So that was a lot of replication of hardware, but it meant that you had a lot of really interesting controls here. So if you listen to some Prince albums like 1999 and Purple Rain, you'll hear a lot of cases where the drums are being pitched in different ways, which is something that was very natural to do with this kind of hardware. Part of the sound of a lot of these early digital instruments was that the folks building them may not have really fully understood modern digital signal processing. So, for instance, there's no anti-aliasing filter on the output of a lot of these instruments. And what that means is that there's these really high-pitched copies of the spectrum of the underlying signal that you're trying to play back that give these machines a certain degree of crunchiness that's a lot of fun, and it's part of their sound. And between both the sound and the inherent experience of the interface, you will have modern artists using things like the Lindrum. A working Lindrum can go for a lot of money nowadays. I'm particularly fascinated by the way hip-hop is a uniquely American form of music that was partially birthed out of this sampling technology. It drew on techniques that DJs with a couple of turntables and a mixer had developed previously, but the introduction of affordable drum machines and general samplers and the ability to play back sampled loops created a new aesthetic. And if you haven't listened to Public Enemy lately, you should go do that. It's a very different kind of sound than a lot of modern hip-hop. I think it's a much denser sound. You will have layers upon layers upon layers of samples, and if you listen to it closely, I think part of the fun of the groove is that the loops don't necessarily always line up quite perfectly. There's something about these loops being played from a keyboard and having the lengths of the sample loops being tweaked by hand without seeing something like a waveform on a computer screen that injects something of an oddly organic quality into something that might otherwise seem like a technical exercise. Of course, given the power of modern laptops, you can play back dozens of instruments using something like Native Instruments Contact or EXS24, which was included with Apple Logic. Actually, I'm showing the old interface here. The newer interface is a lot more minimalist looking. I think they actually changed the name. It's not called EXS24 anymore. I think it's just called something like Sampler. Really creative, guys. Contact, in particular, has a lot of complicated scripting options where you can map different performance controls to the way that different samples will fade in and out. And if you really want some good examples of this, you should check out the Chamber Strings Library by Spitfire Audio. Now, the flexibility and pleasant-looking interface of sampler plugins that you might run on your laptop might lead you to think that nobody's using these old hardware samplers anymore but a lot of people still are. There's a great video by Tom Holkenberg, AKA Junkie XL, an EDM artist turned media composer, who will often take his very expensive synths and sample them with different samplers because each sampler will have its own quirky take on the sound. And in particular, a lot of those early 80s samplers would play back the samples through voltage-controlled filters and voltage-controlled amplifiers, and then mix the resulting outputs. And then you could apply different envelopes and low-frequency oscillators and various controls 
to those filters and amplifiers, resulting in something that's not really a pure sampler or a pure synthesizer from a pedantic point of view, but something that's more of a hybrid. And you could always have your sampler play back loops of an extremely short waveform, in which case you would get something more like the Prophet VS or the PBG 2.3 or its later version, the Waldorf Microwave. I would argue that the Korg DSS-1 is probably the most underrated sampler slash synthesizer out there. And you can pick these up for a reasonable amount of money, which is good, especially since cost of vintage gear has been skyrocketing lately. A lot of the Korg DSS-1 patches will take a sampled attack and layer that with a more sustained synthesized sound. Korg didn't make a big deal out of it, and they probably should have, because the Roland D50 could do this using samples stored in ROM, and Roland made a big deal about it, but the Korg DSS-1 could do this earlier. Early samples all required sounds to be loaded off of a floppy disk or a hard drive. Some later samplers were pretty much just playback instruments, and they used sounds that were built into ROM, these were instruments like the famous Korg M1, and they went by the name of Romplers. <laughs> 